Hi, I'm Sandy Goldberg from Antenna Audio, and welcome to the podcast series from Emory University's Carlos Museum. In each episode, we use an object from the museum's collection to spark a conversation. This time, we've chosen a seductive ancient statue, a gloriously nude depiction of Aphrodite, goddess of love. And she's just been reborn at the Carlos Museum. Well, reattached anyway, because until just recently, the head and the body of the sculpture were in two different places. More on that detective story in a minute. First, let me introduce our guests. To find out what's love got to do with it, I'm talking today with Jasper Gaunt, curator of ancient Greek and Roman art at the Carlos, and Richard Patterson, professor of philosophy at Emory. We're also joined by Renee Stein. As the conservator at the Carlos Museum, she's in charge of the physical repair of this ancient masterwork. If you're sitting at your computer, or if you can see images on your iPod, you can see this Aphrodite statue now. The little baby frolicking next to her is Eros, of course, as in erotic. Jasper, maybe you can begin by describing this statue for us? We're looking at a marble sculpture of a, a nude female figure. She's standing with her weight on one leg, and she's looking to her left. So she's turning around as she does so. And with one hand, her right hand, she covers one of her breasts. And with her left, she has it at her thigh to conceal her genitals. She's totally nude. It's really the first example of the female nude in Western art at life size, which explores female sexuality in an, an open and joyful way. So there weren't nude Aphrodites at this point? No, it wasn't no, 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 no. This, 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 is, this is one of the most revolutionary compositions in Western art. All of these go back to a slightly earlier one, which was created in Athens by a famous sculptor called Praxiteles. And he received a commission from the island of Kos, which is just off the coast of Turkey, southwest Turkey. And they wanted a statue of Aphrodite for a temple or a shrine. And so he made two statues for them. One was nude and one was draped. And the elders of Kos came along to Athens to see which one they would like to have. And they were appalled by the nude one and said, well, this simply won't do. Until Praxiteles had the courage or the audacity or the effrontery, or whatever you want to call it, the shock of the new, to represent a god, uh, the goddess of love naked. She had always previously been shown clothed, usually with wonderful garments, sort of richly um, elaborate folds of cloth, um, heavy drapery, lots of jewelry. What happens then when this town gets this nude goddess and they don't want it? Well, they, they took the draped one. Oh. And they took the draped one and went home. And the people on the mainland, more or less opposite, at Knidos, said, hey, we want the one that you sort of stayed old guys don't want. And they jumped at it. And uh, they took it back to Knidos, and they uh, constructed a circular kind of gazebo for it, a sort of colonnade, and they put it in the middle. And um, you could walk, the whole point was you could walk all the way around it because she was turning slightly. And she became the most famous statue of the ancient world, and people went on pilgrimages to see it. It's the first pilgrimage piece. A Roman writer writing in the 2nd century A.D., has a long poem uh, in which a couple of uh, fellows go off, make a long journey to Knidos, simply to look at it. So, but it wasn't a gigantic statue. How big was the statue we're talking about? Because this one is just a little under life size. I was under life size. The original, we're not sure how large it was, perhaps a tiny bit over life size. But there's a further twist to the story because the model for the, the uh, original was Praxiteles' mistress, the very colourful Phryne, who was the hottest woman of her generation and was in all sorts of trouble and had a very fast business as an upscale prostitute, among other things, and a model for the top artists of her day, including Praxiteles and Apelles. So, Richard, let me ask you, so where do you think he came up with this idea of the nude? Was there anything percolating? Were people starting to accept nudity? That's a tough question, but I think in Athens there were some um, wide open debates about what was natural, including nudity. At the same time, uh, Plato is discussing the ideal city, and uh, he imagines this in his work called The Republic, and one of the provisions there is that women should, by nature, because they are as fit as the men to rule, and this means that they all have to have the same kind of training, including, and this was customary, that men would exercise nude in the gymnasium and so on, and this would be part of his regimen in the, in the ideal city. 
But the women, since they're training for the same job, would have the same training. And that combined with the idea that prohibitions on nudity are, are conventional and not natural. But I wanted to back up a little bit and ask you, Renee, as the conservator, Jasper talked a little bit about the pose. Now, the, the part of the detective story is, of course, the head and the body were separate. But if, maybe you could talk about how we knew that they actually were supposed to be together. Looking at the head and the body, it's possible to first associate the character of the marble, and it certainly seems as though the carving is consistent from one piece to the other. But there's also evidence of their previous joining. Then there was also a more modern repair system, which could be found, uh, evidence of it could be found on both the head and the body. And that again showed that the two parts had been unified in a more recent time and then had become separate and were not reunited until this purchase by the Carlos Museum and the process of putting them together now underway in the lab. Now, this is a funny question, but I've always been curious because, of course, this is, as you said, this is extraordinary because it's the first real female nude. But of course, the Greeks were for centuries doing male nudes. And they were used to seeing those, and they usually included some sort of pubic hair. But here, she's completely bald. Were they just shy about that, or was that reflecting some sort of style of the time? On male sculpture, pubic hair is always shown in the round. And on, on female nude statuary, it's always shown smooth. And whether it would have been painted on, or whether it's a reflection of defilation, of which, for which there's a lot of ancient evidence, hard to say. So ancient hair removal's a possibility. Oh, sure. So, yeah. 